Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by PASA Sustainable Agriculture. Register now for the 2023 conference featuring more than 90 in-person sessions and 25 virtual sessions on farming and food systems. Learn more at pasafarming.org slash conference. Hey, 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 welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. It's Tuesday, November 29th, 2022. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host on Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. So we're talking remotely with uh, two, two folks from Denver, Colorado, and we're going to talk about real beer and lagers and, and Doppelbox. So let's have our guests introduce themselves. Start with Kyle. Hi, I'm Kyle Larkin. I'm the head brewer at Resolute Brewing Company down in Centennial, Colorado. Oh, man, that, that's great. I'm so looking forward to talking to you. And Jerry? Hi, everyone. My name is Jerry Sayote. I'm uh, one of the co-owners and director of brewing operations at Lone Tree Brewing Company in Lone Tree, Colorado. All right. So this is an exciting time of year. You know, we're getting into, you know, December's coming up and, and darker beers. And uh, I, to me, this is real beer season. Um, Jerry and, and Kyle, what, what do you guys like to drink this time of year? Just to, Just to get let our audience get to know you a little bit. Jerry? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, and I think Kyle will probably attest to this as well. We're brewers for a reason. We uh, we can drink anything any time of year, but this year uh, or this time of year specifically is uh, always fun for the darker styles, a little bit heavier on the gravity, a little, uh, a little maltier. And I think they just, uh, as a whole, tend to, uh, tend to market better to our uh, customers and our, our beer fans. Um, I'm a huge fan of, uh, super, super strong, you know, uh, Scottish styles, uh, super malty, wee heavies, uh, something to keep you warm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I can drink, uh, I can drink a stout in the middle of a 90 degree summer day. Uh, but, uh, I think that's the fun of it. Uh, I think Kyle would agree with that. All right. And Kyle. Yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely, uh, back up Jerry on that one. I'll drink pretty much anything year round, but this time of year, I, Lind, lean more towards darker beer, um, usually in the lower ABV end, you know, so Schwarz beer, dark lagers, dark milds, and especially anything with coffee added. And this is also a great time of year for hoppy multi beer, red IPAs, black IPAs, old school doubles. Great. And then we're, we're going to talk about each of your breweries, but one reason that Emily invited us all together was to talk about your collaboration. So uh, we should just jump in. You know, you guys, the process of making a collaboration beer, um, you know, what 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 are some of the, the conversations you had? And uh, you, you, who wants to start on that, Jerry or Kyle? Because it, it, it's kind of exciting, this collaboration beer. I don't, I don't want to give it away, but it sounds like it's really great. Yeah, Kyle, I can jump in here. Um, honestly, it's just kind of getting together and starting off pretty loosely. It's Again, kind of seasonal, you know, what do we want to drink? What's coming up? And really, what do we want to try? Because collaborations are fun because it's a chance for all of us to experiment 
kind of go out of our comfort zone, play around with new malts, new hops, new technique. And that kind of led us to the beer we ended up with. Oh, yeah. And then who, who ends up, uh, you know, deciding on the style of beer? It was a, a group effort for sure. So it was, you know, part our crew, part Lone Tree crew, and really just kind of taking the conversation towards flavors and what do we want to see. Oh, that's great. And Jerry, you want, you want to jump in, uh, tell us about the collaboration? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, we've got a great crew here and, you know, I, I really encourage, you know, our guys here to, um, to reach out to the breweries because I mean, this, this is a very, um, you know, uh, fraternal business here and we, we tend to share ideas and, um, you know, that everyone gets along. And I think that's, that's a huge reason why we love being in this business. And, um, you know, it's, it's good for these, uh, you know, our guys here to get out. And, um, you know, just talk to other brewers and about other techniques and other trends. Um, I think, you know, what's what's made us successful and the same was Resolute is, you know, we we haven't really uh, pigeonholed ourselves into any uh, any one style, any one type of uh, brewing, you know, um, sector. We we tend to hit everything all at once. And I think being able to address the trends and or uh, what's new and exciting is always the best part of collaborations. And um, you know, we'll get into specifics later about the recipe itself, but, um, you know, that's, like I said, I, I think it really amps them up and gives them, um, you know, uh, some, some kind of creative, you know, type of, uh, aspect to, to pursue. But, um, yeah, I think, um, we, these guys love collabs, plus they get to go to another brewery sometimes and drink beer all day and talk about beer. So, uh, that, that never hurts. It never gets tired, right? <laughs> no, it never does. Wow. So you guys, just, you know, some of the background on your breweries. Um, Jerry, you know, you, I know you're a home brewer, but you think that's a, an original story and you don't want to tell me about it. Yeah. But I still want to know, like, you know, t- tell me how you got involved in the business and, um, you know, the, the early stages of your brewery. Yeah, I mean, Colorado has always been a, a great uh, beer state, great beer culture. Uh, grew up here. I've been born and raised. I grew up a little north of Denver and went to, uh, uh, did my undergrad up in Boulder. So obviously another good beer uh, region, um, especially with the support of the BA being up there as well. And, um, you know, like I said, uh, just started off home brewing and, uh, you know, met my future business partner, John Winter. Um, his, his son and I went to, um, to college together up at CU. So it's, it's been kind of a nice, uh, journey along with John over the years. And, um, I, I came into Lone Tree, uh, uh, about a year and a half after it opened actually, cause I was, I was off in the finance world. I was in investment banking and, um, you know, Jimmy, you and I were talking a little bit earlier and it's, it was a great job. I, I was happy to do it and, uh, it was exciting and fun, but, Beer was always kind of something I, I had in the back of my mind. And, um, you know, being able to make that leap when I did uh, after about eight years of uh, being in the banking business, it was uh, it's a it's completely uh, different experience, a, a huge 180. And um, it's it's kind of been like that ever since. It's it's never boring. It's never, never the same. No two days are ever alike. And uh, that's what I love about it. And this business altogether in this industry um, just really helps the creative side of me. I tend to be a kind of uh, an operations black and white numbers guy. And this really feeds my, uh, my creative side. So, um, you know, it just worked out. I feel very lucky. I'm very fortunate. I was able to do it. And um, looking back on it, I, uh, I'm, I'm so much happier for it. So like I said, very fortunate, very happy. And, um, it's a great spot to be. That's great. And then, uh, where is Lone Tree? Lone Tree is, uh, it's about 19 miles South of Denver. Uh, we have a, like a pretty large, um, uh, bedroom community, um, a Highlands Ranch neighborhood. It's a very large uh, development. It's been around about, oh geez, 25, 30 years now, uh, I want to say, and they really help support us and uh, they've welcomed us over the last 11 years and, um, Lone Tree itself it's a pretty small bedroom community as well. And, um, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of great businesses and a lot of good, um, uh, you know, work for people down here. And, 
uh, we have a really good community that supports us here. So that's great, man. I'm looking forward to coming out there sometime. Um, and Kyle, you, t- tell us about where you're from. I know you're from the East Coast. Correct. I'm from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, so southeastern PA. Quick uh, backgrounds. I, after my undergrad, I was working in insurance. I had started homebrewing in college. And after about a year of insurance, that was not for me. And I was on a family trip down Nashville, you know, just hanging out, eating great food, visiting great breweries. And to the end of the trip, my dad was like, well, you know, you could probably do this if you wanted to. It's like, take your shot. I was like, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> so I quit my job in insurance and applied to a bunch of breweries and landed at Figley's Brew Works, which is a small production brew pub in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And, you know, that started it off, learned a lot there. And then pretty quickly, I was able to get my foot in the door at Trogues, which is my hometown brewery. So that was pretty cool to be able to get in there. And that really launched my career and kind of solidified that this is what I want to keep doing. That's great, man. Uh, Trogues, all right. Uh, <laughs> Emma, you're going to jump in here for a minute. You're going to help me out. So what, in your words, this is it. Just tell me what it's like working with these two different breweries, because there's a story here, and um, they're they're definitely like very dedicated, and I can't wait to try the beers. Um, what is it up for you that that makes you excited about working with these two breweries? Well, so thank you for having all of us on. I have a special heart for these two breweries because they're located in the metro area of Denver where I also grew up. And even though I started my drinking and homebrewing career in the Pacific Northwest, when I came home to the Denver area, it was um, a lot of the local breweries that kept me inspired and kept me engaged in the business. Lone Tree has a special place in my heart because they are Radcraft's longest standing client and they put a lot of faith and trust in me when I was getting the business started. And um, Radcraft's about to turn 10. So thank you, Lone Tree, for supporting me for the last decade. And then Resolute has, thank you. Resolute has always been just a stomping ground of mine. I always admired their beer. I really um, enjoyed taking friends and family there over the years since they've opened. And they're actually our newest brewery partner that we've been working with. So today you have folks from my hometown who represent the the old and the new of Radcraft. On top of that, they just created this really exciting collaboration that we're leading into. And without giving away too much information, I'll just say that their choice of ingredients, their choice of beer style, and the passion that they put into this collaboration was why I wanted to tell you about it, Jimmy. Oh, no, that's great. So, Jerry... Um... I know you, you guys have a soft spot for lagers. Tell me about your GABF metal, um, light lagers. Yeah, no, we, um, you know, we were really fortunate back in, um, in 2015, we, uh, we had been producing the, our Mexican lager and, uh, it's, it was, uh, you know, decided, um, to kind of roll that out as a production style for us. And, um, you know, we, we started Lone Tree uh, producing a, a German style Hellas. And, um, you know, it's a great beer. It's a brewer's beer. Uh, fantastic. And uh, everyone loves it. Um, I think the marketing at the time uh, for the Hellas was was a little more uh, challenging. Just, uh, you know, back in 2011, uh, people uh, weren't terribly familiar with the style. Um and uh, once the Mexican lager took a, a silver uh, in 2015 and then a gold in 2017, uh, it just kind of skyrocketed from there. We, we make a lot of Mexican lager now, and it's a great beer. Uh, I'm happy for it because it's uh, what I would kind of call the gateway uh, craft beer for a lot of people who maybe aren't, uh, aren't uh, fully you know, immersed in the craft beer scene or they're new to it. So if someone comes in and says, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a Coors Light drinker, I'm a Bud Light drinker, or I'm a Miller drinker, what do you suggest? We say, well, we got a, we got a, a golden clear, you know, uh, easy drinking lager. It's a Mexican lager, and they have a couple of those, and they're, they're sold after that. So, um, you know, honestly, it keeps the lights on for us. It, uh, it's done very well. Um, it's, um, 
it's a beer we take a lot of pride in and it's it's a very simple beer but to, to replicate it and stay consistent with it over and over i think takes a lot of um takes a lot of care and patience and uh i'm really happy when uh when we're able to do that uh loggers are tough from an operational standpoint uh we give ours 30 days and um from brew day to uh to filtering and that can create a challenge in the brew house and trying to juggle all the tanks we have, all the fermenters and um, the production schedule um, with how much Mexican lager we have to produce is, um, it's kind of a puzzle for us, but that's why I like it. And that's that's the, one of the cooler parts of my job. So um, as of right now, you know, there's, there's a huge reception still um, after many, many years of, uh, you know, just go-to lagers. And uh, when they're done right, um, I don't think there's anything better. Oh, that's great. So tell me more about your job. So you're, you're a director of brewery operations. Yeah, I guess that's, I guess what, that's what's on the business card, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, small business owners can, uh, can wear many hats, you know, whether it's an accountant, a therapist, a, uh, a packaging assistant. I actually just got off the packaging line today. I was a packaging assistant for our, our, our packaging manager, Steve. So, uh, we kind of do a lot of things here, but, yeah, the primary goal for me or the primary responsibilities are, you know, what's going in the tanks? Uh, how do we source those ingredients? How do we schedule the brew house uh, and the brewers to, to accomplish all that needs to be done and get it over to packaging and get it in the cooler for the tasting room? Um, so, like I said, it's it's a puzzle every day. But as an operations guy, I think um, I don't I don't think I'd have it any other way. And um you know, I'm I'm a huge spreadsheet guy, and that's what's uh, that's what saved my life up until this uh, this point. So, uh, uh, I think that's what's going to be on my tombstone one day. The guy could really clean, and he can make a spreadsheet. So, <laughs> so, you, so, you, so you sometimes you you wash out kegs. Uh, well, I'll do anything. Uh, yeah, I started you know cleaning kegs, moving beer around, helping cellar, uh, brewing, and. Uh, I still do it all. Whatever needs to be done, I'm kind of like a utility infielder. But uh, uh, John and I, uh, you know, as owners here, we uh, we each have kind of a, a set thing uh, or set list of things we have to do in a given day. But um, like I said, I I like the variety. I like bouncing around because, like I said, no two days are the same. And um, you know, that's what I love about it. You're not sitting at a desk all the time, right? No, no, I did that for a while. And uh, like I said, there's a time and a place and uh, uh, I enjoyed what I did. But, um, you know, just knew that wasn't going to be my long term uh, career aspiration or, you know, how you kind of have that talk with yourself in your 30s that, you know, how, how am I going to make myself happy and actually afford to afford to do it? And, um, you know, that's that's been the. Uh, the choice and the experiment up to this point and Kyle can probably talk to that as well. It's sounds like, you know, brewing's always been in his blood and uh, once you know, you know, and it's, it's hard to get, hard to get out of that. Yeah. Well, that's good. And Kyle, that, next I want to ask you about some of your favorite recipes to brew, you know, especially as, as you were learning as a brewer, you, you want to mention one or two styles of beer that, that you really like making. Yeah. I mean, one of those is, German Pilsner. Most places I've worked, it's German Pils has always been a core beer. And I've done it different ways at different places. You know, we've done the 30 day beers, cranking them out. We've done, you know, more traditional two, three month beers. And the subtleties within that style, um, you know, what malt you're using, your process, how you're treating your yeast, what hops you're picking. Small tweaks can have such a big impact on final flavor that it's always fun to experiment. You know, you can do two identical Pilsners, treat the fermentation different, and you have two different beers. And that's always fun to play around with. And I also love brewing IPAs because everywhere I've worked, as much as we love our lagers, um, our IPAs sell and hops are great. And there's so much, you know, variety there that it's great to constantly bring in new hops, new techniques, and, you know, push the limits with it and see what kind of flavor we can pack into that thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's like just for, for you being in Colorado, like 10 years ago, everyone talked about Colorado beers and, and New York hadn't really hadn't even been on the map yet. Um, 
you know, what's it like brewing in Colorado? You mean you started out in Pennsylvania. What's the community like? You know, are there any shout outs you want to give uh, to other brewers? Yeah, it's been great. I mean, it's a tight knit community. Uh, I've made friends up and down the front range. You know, we share a lot of ideas. People are there free feed help. You know, you need some chemical, call somebody up. You're short on hops, call somebody up. It's been great. I mean, I moved out here to work with Avery, and that was a great experience. You know, learned a lot there. I mean, obviously, a state of the art facility cranking out large volumes of beer, super high quality. I think two years ago, you know, we got a gold for Lilikoy, which is a, a brewery favorite there. And that was super, we were super stoked on that. Um, I had a short stint at Four Noses, you know, really learned a bit about hazies there because a lot of places I worked, we weren't doing those, at least not the level they are. And that really helped, you know, put another tool in my tool belt there. And I mean, it's been great. It's awesome community out here, and I have no plans to leave anytime soon. Wow! So you, you're you've got a really good uh, kind of roadmap for a young brewer, don't you? You started at a brew pub, you worked at Trogues, Avery, you've checked out some styles at other breweries, and uh, it's pretty neat, man. Yeah, and in between there, I was in Washington D.C. for three years, working for D.C. Brow. And that was great. We know we were doing 15,000 barrels a year, selling it all within the district. And my time there, I actually started their barrel program. So I got to expand my knowledge there and really play around with barrel aged beer, both clean and sour. And that was a great opportunity. And, you know, DC is also a great beer scene. Little light on breweries, but an awesome drinking city. Oh, wow, man. Um... Let's talk about the, the collaboration beer because it's it's exciting and we can go a little deeper into technique and everything. So uh, who wants to tell us what the collaboration beer is? Can announce it. Um, and is it is it out yet? Go ahead, Kyle. Yes, it is out. So the beer is a dark rice lager. I believe we released it two, maybe three weeks ago. Yeah, that sounds about right. And it was something that yeah, it's, you know, something I don't believe either of us have really done. So it was, you know, again, that time of the year, looking at when this would come out, it's, well, what do we want? Something dark, a little roasty, and, you know, and the crew at Lone Tree has used rice a lot, something we haven't done. And I haven't had a lot of dark rice lagers. So it seemed like a great direction to go in. So, so what's the recipe? I mean, it's, it's really fascinating, a dark rice lager. Yeah, so it's pretty stripped down. Um, The base of it, which is Leopold Pilsner. So the Leopold brothers, who are a distillery here in Denver, they also own a malt house. And they're fantastic. Um, Some of the best spirits in the country. And they're doing super high quality, traditionally floor malted grain. So we built it up on their Pilsner. And then it's just some flaked rice and just a touch of chocolate malt to get that color and that little bit of roast and coffee notes to it. And what's the body like? So this is, you know, finished a little bit above two Play-Doh. So it's enough where there's a bit of a chew there, but balancing the dryness of the rice with the bitterness of our hops, you know, it's a clean, crisp finish, but it's not as dry, you know, as a traditional rice lager, which is, you know, scraping your tongue maybe in the summer. So has a little bit more body, more akin to a Schwarz beer. Yeah, I would agree with that, Kyle. I, th- I thought it turned out really, uh, really great. It's, you know, we we definitely used rice before in some of the lighter styles for, you know, rice coals. Or I've, I've done a kind of a tropical style lager with some Nelson Savin and um, really brings out that rice uh, can have kind of a nice vanilla character to it as well. And I thought it played really nice with the malts uh, that were picked out for this. And uh, some of the hops are really cool, too, um, you know, with the Callista and the, uh, I think it was the Ariana as well. Yeah. Uh, you got a little bit of stone fruit in there, a little bit of berry, which uh, kind of balanced out a little bit of that that maltiness and that kind of that roast. Yeah, that Ariana, which I haven't really tried before, but it gives that nice berry, like Jerry's saying, but it also gives just a hit of tobacco and vanilla which is perfect for this recipe. 
So we hit that pretty hard in the Whirlpool with Ariana kind of hopped like a German pills in the Whirlpool. So really giving it that character to add dimension and some depth to the malt bill. Wow. And then w- when you drink this beer, what does it make you think or feel? <laughs> it reminds me of almost like a black IPL. It's not nearly as hoppy, but you know, it's hop forward. It's dry, it's crisp, but you get those nice roasts where it's almost like a mix of a dry stout too. You know, it's got that drinkability of a Guinness, despite its appearance. I would agree. Pairs well with anything, Um, you know, this time of year, tailgate type of season. Um, Anything with a sweater on and, you know, a couple brats on the grill or, uh, you know, a nice uh, seared pork chop. It's, uh, it hits everything. Wow. No, I, I I love lagers with a little bit of color. It seems like everyone's drinking or making, you know, a, a Czech black lager, you know, cool ship black lagers, um, Schwartz beers. Um, I'm all for it and definitely with, with food. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I've never been to Denver and I might be coming out next year. We'll see. But um, the culture out there for beer, like, so th- – this collab that you made and and your tasting rooms like tell me about what what are, are you these tasting rooms where people come and buy the beer are they are they getting pints um you know i did a show years ago with eric wallace from the left hand and he was talking about how important the the independent uh wine beer and liquor stores were to the growth of craft beer in colorado um just to tell me about the like the the customer's experience at your um each one of your breweries and then how also how they can get the the collab beer. Sure, I can kind of kick that off. This is Jerry. Um, so yeah, we have a you know a very traditional tasting room um, uh, concept here. We uh, we only produce uh, and and sell uh, here on site, and then uh, we are with a local distributor uh, throughout Colorado with Western Distribution, and then we distribute a little bit uh, out in. Um, uh, kind of the, the San Luis Valley area, uh, as well as, um, uh, out in Kansas, uh, kind of, uh, not, not a huge footprint out there, but, uh, all of our, you know, 12 ounce cans and, uh, kegs. Um, but yeah, we, we have a, a tasting room, a rather, you know, decently sized tasting room here, here in Lone Tree, um, have a lot of events, have a lot of space for any kind of, uh, you know, receptions and, um, you know, try to stay as busy as we can here. Uh, but, uh, yeah, most, um, kind of larger, um, liquor stores and off premise sales, uh, type of locations in and around this area and the Denver Metro area, uh, we're in. And, uh, you know, it's always been a challenge to kind of keep that shelf space and, um, be relevant. And the more people see you on the shelves, um, the more it helps, you know, drive business in the tasting room. So it's kind of a nice, symbiotic relationship and uh the the fact that we just uh you know the the community here allows us to kind of uh thrive even through covid um help prop us up through covid um that that spoke volumes of of i think uh you know the what people are willing to do to support their local breweries here that's great a lot of pride right oh yeah and then kyle for resolute yeah, I second that. Um, we are primarily taproom focused. We also have a second taproom in Arvada. So we move a lot of our beer on draft between those two locations. We have limited distro of draft up and down the front range, but primarily Denver and the South Metro area. Um, our packaged offering is we pretty much rely on our three cores and cans for the market. So everything else, you got to come to the tap rooms to get it on draft or to buy our to goes there. Um, we definitely rely on our neighborhoods. You know, we want to be that meeting place where people can come, hang out, share a few point, pints, chat, play games. You know, it's obviously it was a struggle with COVID, but we bounced back from that. People are back in and they're definitely drinking our beer and it's been great. And I you know, love that we're able to push so much on draft. It's good for our quality. And, you know, our beer is always presented the way we want it, which is huge for us. Kyle, what what are your what are your core brands at uh, Resolute? So currently we have three year round cores. We have our American Light Lager, we have a Hazy IPA, and a West Coast IPA. And 
all three of those are new brands that we launched this summer. So early August, we basically sat back kind of in the COVID and wanted to remap what we're doing, why we put, what we want to put out there. And for us, it was having a light beer option because we all love crushable lagers, especially out here. And then, you know, we need hops. Uh, <laughs> they always sell it. I mean, who doesn't want them? I love West Coast IPAs. It's definitely something we push here. So those are the three brands we push now. And we're in the process of, you know, hopefully in the next, within the next six months, start pushing out more of our one-offs, especially getting our lagers out there in package and being able to share those with more people. So tell me about when you, when you came into Resolute, you know, were, were there goals? Were, was there a, you know, a change going on? You know, what, what were the, some of the, the conversations you had uh, when you were coming on board? Yeah, when I was talking with our owners about coming on and what we wanted to do, it was kind of a, a bit of a big reset. You know, they had pushed one direction, wasn't quite working the best, and it was a good time for us to say, all right, well, where's the market at? Where can we go? Where do we fit in? And for us, that was dialing back in, focusing more in the tap room, and then really, you know, cranking variety and start to dial in, you know, the styles we do. and how do we want to be perceived in the market? What do we want to be known for? And for us, for the most part, that's hoppy West Coasts and German lagers. That's great. And then um, did you make a, a Doppelbach at, at, at Resolute? Yes. So we brewed our Execrator Doppelbach, which took home silver at GABF this past year. And soon the follow in the next, Two three months, we'll have our barrel aged version of that beer coming out as well. And then, so did you work when you were at Trogues? Did you work on the Troganator? Yes, I spent a lot of nights on third shift <laughs> brewing that beer. Um, it was always fun for us. That's you know a favorite amongst the crew there. It's still a huge beer for them. I believe it's still classified. If you look up Doppelbach and classic examples, it's still there in the top five. And you know it's. It's a great beer. It's there for a good reason. And it's a style, you know, that is you know, a lot of places don't push as much, but why not? Especially this time of year, you know, cold, cold's coming on. Like you just want a big multi lager to warm you up. Yeah. I'll tell you a funny story about this show. For some reason in my mind, I was, I thought this show was about the collab beer was going to be a dark rice Doppelbach. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you that would make still that. Be done. I don't know if you would make that, but so that, and I was because I had a friend talking to me recently. She was like, "Have you heard of of in Japan that that there some people make an all rice beer?" And I wondered if how, how far you would go with the rice. I think that's what I want to ask you about. Like, how far uh, do you go with rice, and in, in, or or could you go with rice? So I won't speak for Lone Tree, but uh, on our end. I wouldn't go more than, you know, probably 40%, especially for the lager style where, you know, we want that, you know, the Maillard flavor. We need that malt to really drive it home because they are such simple recipes. You know, it's not a lot to hide behind and it's all process driven. So I don't think I'd ever go more than 40, but, you know, <laughs> we'll see. Jer Jerry? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with Kyle. We've We've kind of hovered around that range and um some uh some challenges tend tend to pop up when you i think get a little higher in the percentage of rice it tends to be quite sticky and uh can create some laddering challenges and um some really long runoffs and uh that can always be a headache for a brewer but um you know uh, if you give yourself enough time maybe uh kind of create enough room in the in the mash tun with uh with some rice holes kind of space some things out um, I think anything can be accomplished and um, it's all dependent on equipment and, and technique, but uh, yeah, it can be done. And um, uh, that's what craft does. We tend to push the limits on, on just about everything. So uh, not saying it can't be done, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll continue to experiment in the future. Yeah. And that's a thank you, Claire Harton, the Cambridge, New York for asking me to ask that to you guys. Um, sure. Yeah, and then uh, my 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 fun my fun name for a new beer, uh, Kyle. Could you make uh, Doppelbach with some with 
with some rice in it? Or that screw we up? We definitely could. Be? Yeah? No, it'd be a fun thing to play around with, especially if you did, you know, maybe lean towards a pale doppelbach. It would, be, it would fit in great there. You want to know? I, I, have a na- I have a name for you. <laughs> you can what take you, it. What do you got? If you made a, put some rice in a doppelbach, we'd call it the Koji Nader. <laughs> all right. All right. Koji from, you know, making sake and all that. But yep. You got it. All right. That was my joke for the show. So we're, <laughs> on that note, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a few minutes on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Cultivate farms and food systems that nourish, heal, and empower. Register now for PASA Sustainable Agriculture's 2023 conference. Access more than 100 sessions on topics including environmental conservation, food justice, sustainable food and textile production, renewable energy, and much more. Featuring a not-to-be-missed lineup of speakers, including indigenous environmental scientist and author of Fresh Banana Leaves, Jessica Hernandez, Scottish farmer and co-producer of the podcast Landed, Cole Gordon, best-selling author of The Art of Fermentation, Sandor Katz, co-owners of heritage seed company True Love Seeds, Owen Taylor and Chris Bolden Newsom, and many more. There are two ways to attend, virtually or in person. PASA's virtual conference takes place January 17th through 19th. Join from anywhere. PASA's in-person conference is in Lancaster, Pennsylvania on February 8th through 11th and includes social and networking events plus an expansive trade show. Register now at pasafarming.org slash conference. That's P-A-S-A farming.org slash conference. Hey, 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 welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Support us and become a member at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate. We've got over 30 shows each week, food, farming, cocktails, and, of course, Beer Sessions Radio at heritageradionetwork.org. So we're out, we're virtually out here in Denver, Colorado, talking with Jerry from Lone Tree and Kyle from Resolute Brewing, and uh, they made a really interesting collaboration that has piqued the interest of several uh, listeners, uh, the Dark Rice Lager. You know, it's... I mean, I've been drinking a lot of of colored lagers, whether they're, you know, Schwartz beers or Czech black lagers or cool ship black lagers at OEC in uh, Connecticut. But the the rice is intriguing in a dark beer. Um, Kyle, tell me a little more about what the what the rice does in in a dark beer Um, and more about like a tradition. Like, is it a West? Western U.S. tradition of using rice and lagers, um, and Jerry too. If you guys want to go back a little bit in history, you know w- when did rice start getting used in, in in lagers? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure it's as early as rice ca- is being getting used, but I imagine it goes back a while. And I mean, especially here in America, where we have a history of brewing with adjuncts. You know, grains expensive, corn and rice aren't nearly at that cost. So it's a great way to be able to get extract added to your beer at a lower price. And, you know, traditionally in lighter beers, you know, you can boost it up without that cost. But in darker beers, it was kind of an experiment for us because it's adding, you know, just a, it's not adding a ton of flavor. It's, you know, just a light dryness, helping thin out that body while boosting that gravity. But then we're able to balance that against, you know, this roast. And actually, it turns out it lets that roast shine a little bit more because it's not battling with as many heavy grains. So it's been an interesting result for us to see here. So a ri- little rice instead, instead of rye. So, yeah. So normally, you know, let's say we do, like in this beer, if we're doing 80% Pilsner, we're able to cut that Pilsner malt down to, say, 60 and add that rice in. And we're able to hit, you know, all of our same gravities. But now we're letting an even paler canvas for the hops to shine or for the specialty malts to really come through and get some nuance out of them. So it's, you know, it helps similar to like a Pilsner base. It's all about your process and your other grains, you know, letting them shine. The, the rice just gives you a nice blank canvas that you're able to build on top of and really let everything else come through. So it, it, if the malt comes in as malted barley, what, what format uh, does the rice come in? That, and you know, how are you using it in in your brew? 
Yeah, so it comes in you know a lot of different forms. Like the bigger guys, they use rice syrup for their adjuncts. For us, with our here at Resolute, with our standard you know two vessel brew house, we don't have you know a cereal cook or anything fancy. So we get a flaked version, which is essentially the same as rolled oats, but it's rice. So we just dump it right into the mash tun along with the other grains. So super easy to use, and, and really convenient. Wow, and and Jerry. Uh... What about you? You guys working with rice? Yeah, that's uh, yeah, the 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 flaked rice. I think this was uh, crisp uh, uh, was the uh, the supplier on that one as well. But uh, yeah, definitely, um, uh, you know, beer historically has been about what's what's available locally or what's what Mother Nature can provide. And um, I, I'm not shy enough to say that uh, you know a lot of a lot of beers over the years have been accidents or um, you know, very, very crude experiments. And um, you just kind of throw in what what's available through, um, you know, the agricultural region you're, you're a part of. And rice, uh, to me, um, is should, should be talked about more. I mean, uh, the big the big guys have, have discovered this and, you know, I've been brewing it for a long time and uh, getting getting rice in a, kind of a pre gelatinized form like the flaked rice we do get. Um, really kind of simplifies our life a little bit. You still have to be careful uh, with, with going over that, you know, higher percentage, but um, you know, being able to really get at those, uh, those starches um, to, to get your conversions and um, you know, accomplish all the flavor and body profiles. Um, you know, that's, that's been a, a lifesaver for us. Cause like Kyle said, yeah, we're, we're the same. Uh, we don't have a, 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 a cereal cooker here. And um, but the, the products that we do get, um, are fantastic and it's it's a great time to be a brewer because we can still get everything at relatively affordable cost i mean last couple of years has been a little tough for sure and uh mother nature ultimately can can dictate that and um but uh that's it's been really uh fun to play around with this stuff great so back to colorado so colorado you know uh, gabf and the brewers association there's a lot of myths there um and you guys have both won, you know, top medals from GABF. What, what does the GABF mean for you guys being in the Denver area? And how involved do your breweries get in it? Well, this is Jerry. I'll, I'll leave that off. Um, you know, it's, I think what, what a GABF medal does, at least in the competition format, is it, it just validates a lot of hard work um, by all of us here. And, you know, we, uh, like I said, I, I, I came from a former uh, competitive world of banking, and I would say uh, the brewing business is equally as competitive. And uh, we take a lot of pride in, you know, uh, improving upon a style or creating kind of our own our own style in a sense. And, um, you know, from a marketing standpoint, of course, it helps. You know, it, it, uh, it really tells our, our customers and, and our beer drinkers that, hey, I think we're doing something right. So from that standpoint, we love it. Um, you know, we're going to continue to to do what uh, you know what our customers and our our beer drinkers love. And um, when we get a medal for it, that's great. You know, we we're going to soak up every bit of it, and we're going to party because you know we earned it. And um, I think it still has some uh, validity and and some uh, notoriety to 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 medal in in a competition uh, as big as JBF. I mean, I think the last uh, competition. There were over 10,000 individual entries. So just to be able to get anything um, in one of those, the, the odds are pretty small. And um, like I said, it it helps everything. And, and most of all, I think it validates a lot of hard work. Yeah. How, the, how, how was the competition in the light lager category? Oh, it's, it's, it's insane. I think Kyle can, I yeah. mean, uh, some of those, uh, I, I, I think we, we entered our Mexican lager into uh, American style light lager again, or I, I can't remember the subcategory, but, you know, 250 plus entries, you know, you're, you're up against uh, a lot of good beers, so it, you can kind of get lost in that. And, and for you, Kyle, um, was there a thrill in winning at GABF? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was awesome. It's, you know, been doing this for 10 years actually never entered any of my stuff in the GABF. So be able to pick up a medal first year was, you know, super affirming. 
and kind of, you know, like Jerry said, it's great validation for what we're doing in our process. But also, you know, GABF weekend in general is just a great time here in Denver. We have a ton of friends, you know, coming from breweries all over the country. You get to see people you haven't seen in a while. And you just, you know, it's great events around town and, you know, catch up with people, share new ideas, brew more collabs. It's just overall a great time to be around. And if you haven't experienced it, I recommend people come out because just even outside of the competition itself, there's so many things going around town. It's a great weekend. Oh, yeah. So t- tell me, like, if I come out to Denver, in Denver proper, um, wh- what are a couple spots I should hit, whether it's breakfast, lunch, a beer, some of your favorite spots if, if you're in Denver? And and what is Denver? Is it like, is is it, is there a real downtown? I don't know anything about it. Yeah, so downtown, there is a real downtown. It's not the biggest compared to other cities. You know, we're definitely a little bit more neighborhood focused. And I mean, whatever neighborhood you're in, there's going to be a good brewery and there's going to be a lot of good restaurants and beer bars to go to. So it's kind of picking, you know, where you want to hang out. Really can't go wrong most places. You got, you got to tell me the name of one place. All right. My, my favorite breakfast, this is a popular one, but it's because it's great. But Sam's number three. They do fantastic giant breakfast burritos, uh, great Bloody Marys, which crucial for GABF weekend when you're trying to get rid of that hangover. <laughs> That's what I wanted, Kyle. <laughs> and you, Jerry, I, got, I need specifics. Let's go. Jimmy, I, uh, I got a good one for you here. So uh, there's uh, about a, about two miles from where I live is uh, uh, an institution, and um, they go by the name of the Bull and Bush, and they've been around for about 50 years. Uh, it's it's an actual functioning brewery and kitchen, and they are very well decorated. Uh, they've won many, many beers uh, or many medals for their beers over the years, World Beer Cup, GBF. They make uh, British-style IPA uh, called the Man Beer, M-A-N. So. <laughs> It's uh, that's one of my favorite haunts. Uh, like I said, it's it's uh, biking distance or walking distance when I've had a couple. Um, so I would highly recommend that. Um, honestly, any you know, we, we can make a huge list. And uh, my recommendation is either pick up a, a couple crawlers, a couple six packs and take uh, take the trip up to Red Rocks and maybe watch a, uh, a concert up there or watch a sunrise sunset. It's that's uh, that's about as you know Colorado as you can get there. It sounds like fun. Red Red Rocks, all right, all right. Red Rocks Amphitheater, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, can't miss. And uh, but you know, but back to the collab. Um, you know, it's called Abundant Forest. It's a dark rice lager, but it's made with floor raked craft malt from Denver's Leopold Brothers. Um, tell me about sourcing that, and and you know the relationship with with Leopold brothers. Um, I only know it cause I've, I, I've, I've, I've seen him on chats and I've actually got one of his whiskeys right now. So. Yeah, I can jump on that Kyle here. Um, I love Leopold's. I think they make some of the best spirits around. Like you said, their whiskeys are fantastic. They make one of my favorite gins, which is their summer gin it is great in any gin forward cocktail. But they started their malt house, I want to say maybe two or three years ago before it really got going. But their one owner, Todd Leopold, is just you know a great guy, super knowledgeable. He brewed for you know over a decade before he started his distillery, and they decided to expand into the malting world. And it's actually been a little tough to source recently because their distiller malt has been taking off and is most of their production. So fortunately, I was able to lock in with our with them and our grain supplier to secure, you know, like 30,000 pounds a year from them to make sure we have it because it's I love sourcing locally and their Pilsner is the base for a lot of our beers. And it's it's been really great. It's I worry, you know, what their production will be coming up because they make such good malt that they're starting to go straight towards distiller malt. It's really tough to get their pale and pilsner these days, but they still do small amounts for some of us local guys, which is very fortunate for us. Well, that's great. So so this wasn't just a, a one-off collab. This is, you're working with them regularly. 
Yep. So our Hellas, which we you know try and keep on as much as we can, is 100% Leopold's. Actually, most of our loggers are Leopold base. The Doppelbach, all the Pilsner Mall, and that was from Leopold's. And we've I put in IPAs, I put it into Belgians, pretty much everything we brew. I've tried to use it. Are there other other um, you know craft maltsters that that you're using as well? Yeah, there's a couple other. Um, there's one up in Fort Collins, Troubadour. I haven't used them as much, but we use them pretty heavily. When I was at Four Noses, they do a lot of they do a lot of great wheat. They have a great uh, Pilsner malt, but one we use a lot is from Root Shoot Malting in Loveland. And they do a pale malt, which is fantastic, called Genie Pale, which is similar to Simpson's Golden Promise. And that's been a base for a lot of our IPAs, especially Hazy's, because it packs a lot of punch for a pale malt, and you don't need a lot of supporting grains with it. Is, do you think, is that the case, that, that many of the small craft maltsters are, are known for, for certain malts? So a lot of the places, at least in my experience, they do a pretty good variety. Usually nothing heavily kilned or roasted. You know, more Pilsner, Pale, Munich, Vienna is tends to be their focus. But, you know, that's the base of a lot of beers, and especially when we're talking pale ales or any kind of light lager. I mean, that's the flavor that's coming through. And kind of a lot similar to a lot of the craft breweries, like they have the same attention to detail, same love for what they do. and it definitely shows in the final product. Yeah. What percentage of, of malt, you know, generally are you getting from, you know, Colorado maltsters? So for us here at Resolute, it's, I would say 60% of our beers have Colorado malt in it. And that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. It's, you know, our primary base malt. We obviously expand out into other maltsters, but you know, we try and use Colorado maltsters as much as we can for the base of our beers. You know, we like to keep it local. Our yeast is local. Our grain's local. And as the hop um, scene out here continues to grow, you know, we'll try and switch to more Colorado hops. Yeah. And how, how far out are you, you know, do you have contracts? You, are you planning out, you know, next year already or is it already planned? So I still have to speak with our reps and try and secure some malt for next year um, with some of the malts there's not an issue but again with leopold's we'll see hoping i can secure another another round uh there and make sure we're covered for next year but that's kind of based on their production and is it true that you got a free bottle of whiskey with every order <laughs> should be should be right I, I i did get my first bottle from them so um i'm I'm saving that for the holidays. And Jerry, it's to bring it all full circle back to you, sourcing and Colorado ingredients um, at Lone Tree. Yeah, it's definitely something we're we're trying to incorporate more of. I mean, um, you know, cost is always a factor and uh, reliability is is always something that, that's got to be, um, you know, um, folded into the mix there. And uh, yeah, we have um, uh, silo contracts and bulk malt contracts through uh, through RAR and, and BSG for kind of uh, our you know base two row. Um, you know, so most of that's uh, you know coming coming from out of state. And um, uh, but like I said, we're we're trying to incorporate more from uh, you know a lot of the monsters that, that Kyle's been talking about and um, uh, trying to you know do as much as we can on a local level and. Like I said, it's you know we're we're about four thousand barrels uh, a year, and you know just uh, consistency is key with us, and to, to be able to make a uh, very consistent product uh, time time after time is 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 always a priority. Um, but you know the this this state is is good to us, and we want to be good to it as well. So uh, always trying to incorporate more into that. No, you you guys have really represented your your brands well. Um, last thing, just something about different ingredients in dark beers like porters. Last week, I was in Portland, Maine at Urban Farm Fermentary, and uh, the founder, Eli, said, I'm drinking a, a chicory root porter. Um, have either of you ever used, like, roasted dried chicory root in a beer, or is there another ingredient that you, you, you've used that you want to tell the listeners about? Kyle? 
Sure. I, yeah, I've not used any kind of chicory or roasted chicory. Um, with our specialty grains like that, we usually don't go too fancy. But my go-to in a lot of our dark beers is pale chocolate from Chris Malting. It packs huge coffee and chocolate with nutty flavors, but without as much acridness as you get from a more highly kiln chocolate malt or even a roasted barley or black malt. So that usually gets sprinkled into, I would say, 90% of our dark beers. That sounds good. And Jerry, any any, uh, any secrets from you? Yeah, I think um, a lot of the maltier styles that we like to do and a lot of dark ones, like a, a you know, like a 22 Plato Wee Heavy. Uh, I, I really enjoy um, um, Golden Naked Oats. Uh, Simpsons does a really good job there. Just kind of gives a nice, like, nuttiness to to uh to round out some of those darker malts um let's see what else uh the weirdest thing i think we ever used uh then this isn't really specific to dark beers but uh back in the day we did a collaboration with sycamore brewing and it was a uh, uh, india pale lager and we wanted to incorporate kind of a, a a strange you know um colorado ingredient uh so we used i believe it was malted sunflower seeds from colorado malting company and uh uh you know it wasn't a huge part of the grain bill but uh it was kind of fun i think you could kind of pick it out of there and um you know that was that was an interesting experiment malted sunflower seeds and what 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 was the flavor what did it add it just i think uh gave it like uh another like little little nuttiness um um just kind of a nice uh you know complement to to some of the hops that we had in there too so it was kind of fun that sounds fun and then we know you got a soft spot for wee heavies, don't you? I do. It's it's one of my favorite styles, and uh, we we've done some barrel aging for that, and uh, we're going to be releasing for our anniversary party um, in a couple weeks. Here, uh, we're going to do uh, a Breck rum barrel aged uh, version of our wee heavy that uh, uh, barrel aged for about a year. So we're gonna we're gonna roll that out here for our anniversary party. Oh, that sounds great. So Jerry yeah. and Kyle, we're we're going to close out, but. Is there one question that that you'd like to ask the the other guest um, or something we didn't talk about? Um, I'll, I'll kick it off. This is Jerry. I, I would uh, ask Kyle, uh, what do you think the uh, the future of the West Coast uh, revival is going to be for uh, for next year? I think it's going to be strong. I can't say nice. nationwide, but I know out here. There's a lot of breweries kicking out fantastic West Coasts. You know, Westbound and Down has been leading the charge with that one. Yep. We do our part, and, I mean, I don't think they're going away. And I'll do, do everything I can. I agree, and I'm happy, I'm happy to see that. And then for, How about this? For either of you, since you mentioned that, what, what's a West Coast IPA that, that you remember or you'd like to, to give a shout-out to? I, I remember when Green Flash had their West Coast I don't know, 12 years ago, I was, I went nuts over it. Ooh. Well, specifically, um, there's a lot of great ones, Pacific Northwest. Breakside's just been putting out fantastic West Coast for a long time now, and I love their beer. But right up there with them is Georgetown Brewing in Seattle. Those guys are just, they're crushing it with their IPAs. And if anybody ever gets out there, you know, you got to try Bodhisattva and some of their others. They're just fantastic. Oh, that sounds good. And, and Jerry, West Coast IPA for you, bro? You know, I, I think in the beginning, um, uh, I'll be honest, I, you know, uh, we, we were really close to the dry dock folks and still are. And, you know, I loved a good hop abomination back in the day and still do. And, uh, I mean, anything right now uh, locally, I would say, you know, Cannonball Creek and um, uh, Comrade just do amazing stuff right now. And, um, you know, like I said, when you, whenever you're out here, Jimmy, make sure you, you hit hit up those guys too because they're, I think, kind of um, – they're, they're the gold standards uh, in the West Coast arena and um, just incredible stuff. Yeah, I'll second that one big time. Those guys are fantastic. All right. And, Kyle, you got a question for Jerry or should we close it out? Yeah, uh, what are we doing the rice topple back? The rice topple. <laughs> when, whenever Jimmy's coming out to brew with us, that's that's the answer. All right, well we'll, we'll surprise you. And uh, Koji Nader, you can use that. You can use the the name. 
It'll be, right. it'll go we'll nuts. Keep, we'll keep a tank open. All right. All right, you guys. Thanks so much for joining me, Jerry and Kyle. Uh, thanks to our engineer, Armin Spengen. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host on Beer Sessions Radio. We'll catch you next time on Heritage Radio Network. All right. Thanks so much. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.